everyone, and welcome to a program of Assembly Required. Um, today we'll be talking about when public space becomes risky space. So today we have moderating this panel, Sophia Dotta, who is an artist from Venezuela. She also is a master's candidate at Arizona State University in creative enterprise and cultural leadership, as well as a public art assistant at Tempe Public Art. Sophia will be introducing us to today's panelists, as well as turning to each of them in short presentations before turning to a discussion, followed by your questions and answers. So please do place your comments and questions in the chat box when the time comes. I will hand it over to Sophia. Thank you, Jenna. Um, hi, everyone. Thank you for uh, being here. I'm happy um, to be moderating this conversation, and I'm really looking forward to it. Um, today, uh, we're going to be considering what public spaces means. And um, excuse me, I have my computer is all over the place. Um, and looking into how uh, public space being one of the main platforms for connecting people in art and design, and observing a little bit of how the situation has changed or interaction. Um, and how we experience those, those spaces. Uh, we're gonna talk about creative practices and how and their, their role and their power to shift what's possible. Um, and also talk on some lessons and um, on how can we look into community gathering exchange and rebuilding and restructuring our public spaces for um, more equitable, while also responding to pressing challenges that our community is facing. Um, we have a super um, awesome group of people today that are or panelists, so I'm going to be introducing them and then handing over to them. Um, we have uh, Wanda de la Costa, who is a member of the Saddle Creek Nation and also an institute professor in the Herberger Institute of Arts and Design. And she's the director and founder of the Indigenous Design Collaborative. Uh, we also have Saria McKeith, the director of Community Health and the Trust for Public Land, at the Trust for Public Land, excuse me. And we have Carrie Christensen. Um, she's a Herberger Institute Practices for Change Fellow, and a Senior Planner of the Minneapolis Park and Recreation Board. Um, I'm gonna hand it off to Wanda uh, for presentation, and then we'll take it from there. Yes. All right, and you can hear me. So um, I created this uh, presentation, I think I have a 12 or so quick slides to go through. And I, I entitled it about returning to resilience. I often think um, as indige with indigenous worldviews that there was a resilience. And I, so to me, I heard a wonderful Anishinaabe saying that it talked about returning to ourselves. And I love this idea of returning to the resilience. So um, inspiring to me, I just read a recent um, um, commentary by the UNESCO chief. And she was talking about this time being a very positive time, a moment of positivity. And I think this is, even though we're all, you know, trapped in our houses and um, um, uncertain future at, lies ahead of us, I think it's important to really think about this in a positive lens. And she did that. She talks about this period as a period of openness right now, which I think is really important. Um, that is uh, with its ability to strengthen the links between artistic creation and society. She recommends this two-part approach, which she talks about first supporting cultural organizations and um, professionals, but also promoting access and art for all. So what she thinks is necessary, how do we get there? And I think this is where I wanted to kind of zoom in. She talks about this new broader lens and it's really about listening to the voices of their artistic world in their globality and diversity. So with that, let me zoom back really far narrow into my neighborhood. When I was starting to think about what did I really need in the COVID-19, you know, I sat in this period of reflection. I was like, what was really necessary? And you'll see those six things that I put on there. This is what we and our family, you know, I'm a mom. This is what I needed for survival. The first four of those were available in a three block radius. The other two were delivered to me. And I think what... I want to also highlight is that what's not on this list is nothing, anything to do with money, which we all have it, everyone on this, on this um, chat right now, we can afford all of the above, but there's many more that are struggling without. Um, and so when I thought about this idea of um, 
what, how do I translate those, that thinking about what I actually needed personally to survive and how this might change the future of the way I live? I started to think about seven ideas that I think, um, you know, based on what I've been reading and kind of what I've been thinking on, that I think are really, really critical. So I'm going to go through them quite quickly. There's a few that I think are important that I'll spend a bit more time on. But um, for me, this notion of rethinking density, I don't know if people have uh, heard the studies, but apparently a third of the American population is now considering relocating to less crowded places because of COVID-19. So and in terms of demographics, the 18 to 35 year olds are the most likely to think about moving which is quite shocking. So I begin to think about this sort of multinodal city, urban development that could happen. And what happens in those neighborhoods? What happens into those multinodal centers? And so number two, I think this focus on the neighborhood just is what has happened to me over the last, you know, two and a half months or so. You know, can we relocate the social, creative, um, connecting, gathering amenities to these more decentralized areas. And this is a public park solution that was done, you know, creating these wide, six foot wide or three foot wide corridors that people could do these activities. And I started to think about the kids in my neighborhood, like riding scooters around here, playing hide and go seek in here, um, you know, getting people, the adults being, keeping fit in here. So I think there's a, a series of new ideas that um, uh, can come to the table from this. I think the third thing I wanted to call out is this, this is what I call a resource shift. You know, I think all of us, there's a new appreciation of the, the value of public space and connectivity. But I think we're really gonna have to not only think about creative ideas, but I think we're gonna have to be given the resource to be able to get there. You know, how do we congregate safely now in parks, plazas, promenades and so forth? Um, but I would argue what I think is most exciting to me is that there are a lot less resource intense than what we used to do when we used to have to move around so much. It's a powerful kind of resource shift notion. Um, and I think in terms of the spotlight, number four is the spotlight on equity. You know, I've, um, as many of you know, um, many people around the world have um, an, a not an equitable relationship with basic infrastructure. You know, I think a Navajo Nation, what's happening up there right now. So housing, water, uh, infrastructure, but now I'm also thinking about public space as um, it's not an equal, sh equally shared resource. We all we know that there are fewer parks and public um, spaces in close proximity to low income residents and communities of color. We also know that even when they live close by, they're le less likely to frequent these spaces. So barriers of perception to public safety, park entry fees, perceived racial discrimination, these have all prevented users, diverse users from using these public amenities. So I think this notion that UNESCO chief brings up about this broader lens, you know, do we know what um, people of color, communities of color need in their public spaces? Have we done enough research? You know, and I, when I was thinking about this last night, we are doing a tribal housing project for a local tribe. It was so surprising to us because they weren't concerned so much about the aesthetics of the physical structure. They were more concerned about the views to the nature and to the outside, right? Total shift. Um, and I think important if we're going to start redesigning our public spaces, we need to bring that lived experience and we need to bring the people of color. And despite the fact that we're vastly underrepresented in fields of design, and that would be Indigenous, Latinx and African American, I think we need these critical allies. We need citizen experts to help us understand what is important in these areas. And I thought, you know, if there was such thing as a blank canvas to give our communities color with a period of self-definition so they could define what is important, I think we would have a very, very different, um, pers a different um, design of our public spaces. Number five, heat mitigation. So this is a really cool project, the Land Art Generator Initiative. Many of you know it. They bring, they make energy cool. And I think we do all these shade structures in Phoenix. Why don't we actually add energy to our shade structures? You know, make it useful and functional. And then number six, radical interrelatedness. Um, I start to imagine if we leave the world of our cities up to developers, it's going to look very different than having it be led by our youth 
And this notion of radical interrelatedness is really about connecting humans with the built environment and the natural environment. This is something that is a very deep in conversation whenever we do Indigenous design. And so I think in order to do that, we need the next generation. And then finally, the last idea is this notion about making things relocal. You know, I think for everything from food production to architecture, there's been a big push to kind of hone it in and kind of what's available in our area. This is a rammed earth house in Phoenix in an area that I live. And I think this vernacular building intelligence, this is the way the indigenous people used to design here long ago, is really something to really keep uh, in mind. Um, and so those were the seven that kind of the thinking where I went, I'll stop there. And I just wanted to share, I found as I was doing, digging around this wonderful um, webinar coming up in a couple of weeks. So I wanted to leave you with that. Thank you so much, Wanda. I, um, it's super interesting, this idea of returning to resilience and taking this moment uh, for a, posit a positive sort of uh, look into the future rather than a daunting one. Yeah. With that, I'm going to... We'll come back to this conversation, but I'm going to hand it up to Sadia um, for your presentation. So go ahead. Hi, everyone. My name is uh, Sadia Keith. Uh, I am with the Trust for Public Lands. Um, and in looking at uh, our work, we essentially create parks and protect land for people uh, ensuring healthy, livable uh, communities for generations to come. And obviously, during this time, it has come into question what these spaces really mean. We see more now more than ever when you can't go to a restaurant, when you can't spend time in um, a, a community center, for example, that it's really public spaces where there's sort of fresh air um, uh, that, that people are spending time. And so just I'm going to do a really quick um, uh, introduction, just background and my perspective as a public health professional um, in this space um, and, and thinking about, as, um, uh, as we mentioned earlier, really about as a hopeful time to potentially walk through this portal um, of, uh, uh, and make changes that are, um, have been really longstanding when it comes to the perspective around uh, health equity. Uh, for nature, nature has been a long, um, this is an image of uh, why we do our work is around the commitment to health equity and climate with community at the center of our work. Uh, but nature has been a long time sort of underutilized tool for that. Um, and the interaction of nature, particularly in urban spaces, though not specific to it, uh, really uh, requires that participatory process. Here you see images um, of our, uh, one of our initiatives called the Green Schoolyards Initiative, where students come together to help design their own um, uh, schools, their playgrounds. And then from the, after the build, there's sort of the stewardship phase where we see um, community members engaging with older adults uh, from a senior center nearby, leveraging that space for uh, food and for um, a, a community garden. And so one example of that participatory process where uh, art and uh, community engagement and health really came together was in uh, Wenatchee, where uh, a group uh, under the efforts to uh, develop this park um, were, was formed called Parque Vigrinos. And in that group, um, uh, came together to uh, inform the design and uh, create really a space for that social engagement. And it sort of comes back to this time around coronavirus where we don't necessarily have those uh, traditional spaces of public engagement. What are, how can we pivot? How can we think about what those resources already uh, are in our community um, to, to continue to facilitate that? But beyond that, there was something else that happened, but there was really power building, um, that community co-leadership um, turned into uh, uh, an opportunity for a voter campaign um, at, where the, the Padrinos, uh, Padrinos came together and uh, conducted uh, numerous, uh, uh, I think over 4,000 phone calls and 3,000 uh, door knocking campaigns, um, uh, uh, knocking on doors, and uh, were able to increase the Latino turner vote out, a uh, vote Latino voter turnout uh, by uh, threefold uh, in the midterm election in a place that had uh, not only just underrepresentation within the government structure, but uh, in terms of engagement within the, the civic process. Um, and so that's really sort of getting to this next component of what I'm going to talk about, which is health. When we think about health and health equity and health care, it often comes back to, oh, a hospital, a physician, um, a nurse, right? That's the first image we get. But here at the Trust for Public Land, we're really thinking about it from the perspective of 
a complete state of physical, mental, and social well-being, not just the absence of disease. And that's really driving towards um, what we've seen uh, that have existed for a very long time um, in, in this context of coronavirus, that not everyone has had a fair and just opportunity to be as healthy as possible. And that context, as we move forward, really means that we remove these um, obstacles around poverty, racism, discrimination, as well as their consequences. And so it's really about tailoring, not just at the individual level, but really at the community level. It's not about equality, it's about equity. As you can see, if I was, I'm five two, if I was riding LeBron James's bicycle, we would not go very far. Um, however, uh, as, as a ch you know, the child, I don't understand how he's standing up right there at the end. Um, but it's really about moving these conditions forward in a way that really interacts. It's not simply about just jobs, just food. Um, we're human beings and we really need the range of, of, of resources. And th that's called the social determinants of health within the public health space. Um, the conditions in which we live, learn, work, and play that affect a wide range of the risks of our behaviors as well as our health outcomes. Um, and that means that as we look at the different types of efforts that we are, that this is a CDC, uh, former director of CDC, Tom Frieden produced this uh, health impact pyramid of the different types of um, outcomes, that we don't just talk about clinical interventions at the top. We really move down to change the context in which people are making their decisions. This is an example of that, another example of that really that has to impact, not just medical, not just sort of individual social sort of services, both are definitely needed, but that we go upstream really looking at the laws, the policies, the regulations that are quite invisible at often that are driving um, the, the context of our community condition. Um, and so one of those conditions, you know, they're social, but they're also physical. This is a before and an after of what our, uh, one of our green schoolyards programs. Um, of what it means when you have a green schoolyard. Sedentary activity among children decreases when you have a green schoolyard. Physical and um, sort of social altercation decrease when children have that time and space to play. Um, we also do work around parks and uh, trails and land. Uh, but I think it's really bringing together uh, the sort of toolkit of how we do our work, right? We need the data, we need the insights, we need the advocacy and the funding and the leverage but it's really about creating a process in terms of part creation that's participatory, community relevant, and that actually is able to leverage things like art and design um, to inform uh, that local responsiveness. Um, and so this is the way that I think about uh, our work, uh, you know, that we drive evidence-based action, we boost community partnerships, and we need to change mindset so that we can get to that high quality access. Because if, and even if access exists, access exists, um, that there isn't necessarily the quality um, and the, the usage, as was Wanda referred to earlier, about who feels safe and then the support. So we all have healthy, livable neighborhoods for generations to come. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Sadia. Um, we're going to come back to some questions that you um, touched on. I'm going to hand it over to Carrie now, and then we can kick off the conversation. Go ahead, Carrie. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Happy long weekend. I hope it's a long weekend. I greet you from the north where I have to wear a jacket when I go outside still. Um, so I'm really honored to be part of this conversation uh, and think and talk with you all about this really important moment in our history um, of, you know, of public space and, and the importance of what it's, you know, it's able to offer us right now. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to have all sorts of animal metaphors in my, my, my talk today, but this one I love. This is a communications department at City of Minneapolis put this one together that I think is a beautiful nod to how humor and pop culture can help us, um, you know, have, provides us with tools and uh, kind of lightens some of the heavy realities that we're living with. So um, I think this is also, this is probably more what I think about in, you know, as a park planner. So I'm in Minneapolis, Minnesota, and uh, we've got a great park system up here that um, lots, I think it's 98% of Minneapolitans live within a walk of a park. So um, everyone's just been out in droves in our park system. And as was mentioned, I think by both of the, you know, with Wanda and Sadia both mentioned, 
how important public space is right now as a third space. Um, and for all of our lovely cultural institutions and community centers being closed, there are so many roles that our parks and our public space are playing. Um, and so here's a, this is a great, another communications piece. I always like to give a, a shout out to all the great graphic designers in the world, but this is, we've used this a lot. I know a lot of park agencies across the country have used it um, just as a really important way of both graphically and in words articulating some of the ways that we can keep our public safe is, our, our public spaces safer in this, this era. Um, so as I mentioned, you know, Minneapolis, we've got lots of parks. We actually just two days ago, hey TPL, nice to see you. you, you we just were awarded the number one park system in the US. Um, and that's, that's selected through a series of different um, indicators that Sadia can probably explain way better than I can. But basically it's the amount of parkland that we have in proportion to the rest of the city, um, the kind of state and investment of our amenities like playgrounds, uh, you know, what, how are they doing? How many of them are there? Um, what kind of investment goes into our park system. And then finally, that 98% of Minneapolitans living within a walk of a park um, has been a really important part of our system. And that, you know, that's been historically was put in place in the late 1800s and have really grateful for those roots. Um, we're also a, an independent park agency, meaning that we aren't part of our city government. We have our own elected body, our own taxing authority, um, and we are a public agency that really gets to prioritize parkland and public space in all the work that we do, um, which is wonderful. I think we've traditionally had less sort of back and forth around um, kind of what's most important to our city conversations that maybe other park systems might need to have in times of crisis. You know, we really get to stay focused on, hey, what role can parks play in this time of crisis? Um, so now for my other animal imagery. Um, I, I've been thinking a lot about the tortoise and the hare this week and in a conversation actually with a number of the ASU Practices for Change fellows. Um, and we were talking about how in COVID we're seeing government like small, you know, local government like mine being more nimble and, and large institutions and all sorts of places having to really adjust quickly to this time, right? Even, I mean, as individuals, we know that's certainly, we're all having to adjust really quickly too. Um, but there's all sorts of interesting quick contemporary changes happening. And those um, can maybe will be prototypes for the way that our system uh, will be moving forward, right? So this is a, a street closure, a parkway closure, which is a series of, we have like 70 miles of parkway all throughout Minneapolis that's actually considered linear park. We've closed off miles and miles of those, of those parkways with very temporary infrastructure, as you can see. Um, and it's a really important thing for allowing social distancing in our park system at this time. And it's also a really exciting thing for a lot of folk because there's, there's actually not a lot of residential areas along these parkways. So it doesn't impact people trying to get to work, for example. Um, and it's, it's creating some car-free places and spaces that people never thought would be car-free, right? So there's some kind of radical transportation planning impacts. Um, on another front, like, you know, community engagement, man, we've got, you know, we've got so many different projects happening right now in Minneapolis, and we're really dedicated to keeping community voice at the center of, of informing our design and other policymaking processes. And man, this is what that, those conversations are looking like now, right, on Zoom. And so this is another really big adjustment. And thank goodness for technology, I, um, but I also, you know, definite love-hate relationship. Um, when I first made this slide, earlier today, I had a question mark, like this is what democracy looks like, question mark. Um, but this is another, you know, with the tortoise and the hare, this is another kind of hare, like getting us there quickly, right? This is a quick adjustment. Um, and then finally, well, actually not quite finally, but almost finally, um, this, is a, this is an example of actually trying new facilities and new ways of offering services and parks through the physical space. And, uh, you know, like many cities in the US, we are faced with um, a, a real crisis in terms of um, people experiencing homelessness. And uh, this, one of these images isn't from Minneapolis, but I think it gives a good, these are both good examples of ways that we're bringing 
temporary facilities into public spaces that are providing core essential functions for people um, that they might not be able to get, for example, if they're experiencing homelessness. And these are things that we either haven't had the capacity to do in the past or, um, or you know, it hasn't been a priority. Uh, and so I think it's really, it's really forcing us to reprioritize like, hey, for people that are experiencing homelessness right now and you are sheltering in place, what does that look like? And so how do we make sure that the hygiene of our community collectively is as good as it can be in this current state, right? Um, and then I also, you know, management of public space is also a really important part of, of when I think about public space, it's not just the design. We have a police force that's park police only um, there on the left. And they really, their sole focus is safety, right? Um, they, they're, they're an important, you know, part of our system. Um, but we also, during COVID, have rolled out these park ambassadors, and that's actually a downtown ambassador slightly different role but um, that they're playing not only a safety so they're there to help park visitors remember to social distance they're there to you know provide any kind of uh, resource or just answer questions um, and, and I like to these park ambassadors are very new to us we've just started implementing them in the last month um, and I think they're they're both about safety and about welcome but we think about what if we continued to have park ambassadors over time and, and really thought about how do we create education and programming and um, safety and welcome all kind of wrapped up in, in the way that our staff are showing up in parks rather than just the sole purpose of safety. Um, and then finally, you know, the, the tortoise and the hare. So those are all examples of, I think, the, the, the hare, but the rabbit moving really quickly right through the race, but the, the tortoise. I think it's so important to remember that all these quick, nimble kind of experiments and trying to figure out how to be our best selves in COVID, um, there's also these long-term systemic solutions that we need to keep on our radar. And I, I, those, you know, there's some heavy, slow lifting too that we should also be doing at this time. Um, and this is a, you know, this is a really great, um, organization that has done a lot of mutual aid kind of work in Minneapolis uh, around this question of of how to you know show up for folks that are unsheltered um, in public spaces but they also at the same time have been lobbying really hard for uh, you know for forgiveness of um, rent burden and all sorts of uh, really important parts of, of getting people through this crisis and then also thinking long term about making sure housing stays affordable and we get more shelters in Minneapolis. So they're, I think they're doing some really interesting work around this multi-pronged approach of like the tortoise and the hare. So I'm trying to keep that on my radar as we move through all of this. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, I think um, just hearing you all sort of answer these questions of what the, the panel is about, you've all brought up a lot of um, sort of truths and kind of lifted the rug and, and shown some of the truths and priorities that the situation has, has shined a light on. Um, it's it particular, it's been exciting to see a lot of initiatives, uh, creative initiatives that have been service, surfacing as responses to, to how important public space is, to um, how can we navigate and cope with the situation. And we, we, I think we're seeing the, the immediate impact um, but, but I also been thinking, I'm, I'm curious to hear from you too, like how are these sort of new opportunities um, going to shape the future of art and design and, and how we interact with public space? And, and you know, we have some social distancing uh, right now, we have wearing masks, we, we're taking all these, these measurements and but how is that gonna look like? What, how is that going to affect us? Um, and what are we gonna take forward with us? And um, I guess so I'm gonna start with a question and I guess feel free whoever wants to jump in first to um, to answer it, but uh, how do you think, so you all mentioned the importance of public space, right? Out of being in touch with nature, so, but there is also a, maybe a layer of, of not knowing how and fear, but how does, how can and how will public space become a solace again for creative communities and for people 
Uh, and how are they going to affect each other? So how is it going to be a solace? So how creative practices are going to be a solace? And how is public space going to be a, also a solace for um, creative communities since other indoor spaces are proven to be a little more risky at this point? Um, I see some nuts, but I don't know who wants to jump in first. Um, sure, I can to... jump in from like a very technical perspective, right? Uh, so in this concept of solace, we're talking about mental health and social health. Um, and when we think about any of the um, many, many of the um, sort of lockdown measures that were put into place, they said um, they had exceptions for physical activity because it is an essential part of what people need. Um, and so how we think of not only getting that physical activity, um, that, that we need those public spaces that are sort of, as, as Carrie references, the democratizing, um, and that, that solace that we find in nature, um, you know, numerous mental health benefits, uh, uh, people have measured, you know, being active in a gym versus in, in nature and found that nature has additional benefits around that. And so that, that kind of information, it's seeping in, I feel, um, into um, people's use and like how people are looking to engage in spaces, but there is sort of the behavior, um, but there are a couple other components, right? And so it matters if legislative bodies and administrative bodies are then able to continue to support those public spaces um, uh, to ensure that that access and that quality remain um, as we are heading into quite challenging times when it comes to the economy when it comes to competing health priorities. Um, and so there, that's sort of the, the approach. But I think that is what really requires a more system thinking and a whole, like thinking about the whole person and not sort of thinking about, um, you know, a, a one lens look to, to any um, one of the many things that people need. Sure. Sure. Um, I think for me, you know, I'm a, I'm a lover of arts-based community development. And I think that those, the intersection of where, how can we deliver community development services and resources um, in partnership with creative thinkers, with artists, uh, there's, there's always gonna be a better solution in my mind. Like, I, I think that that kind of cross-sector collaboration, um, my hope, it, it, I think you know I, I'm worried about our cultural institutions in this time, and I'm I'm deeply concerned about you know so many um, so many amazing arts organizations um, at this time, and I, I think that my hope is that with you know places like my agency, even though we're struggling in our own way too financially, I think that it's going to be those cross sector partnerships moving forward that are going to bring more success to our community development systems, but also create more, more um, pathways for creative practitioners um, in the next few years. And we can't, neither of us can do it alone and neither of us should be doing it alone. So um, I just want to make a plug for, I think that that is probably the most important part of, of that question for me right now, Sophia. Totally. And if yeah. I was going to respond, I would just quickly say that we just put in a grant application between a, one of the cities in Phoenix with our Indigenous um, Design Collaborative with another youth-centered diverse group who does youth engagement. So it's these very unusual partnerships coming together to kind of brainstorm, you know, our options for the future. Yeah, totally. It's super important at this time to work together as, as wholes and to, to think and bring people from all, all sorts of sectors. And um, I guess that takes me to, to the next question, which is in this, in this light of trying to um, get everyone involved and, and, um, and in participation, how, do you, how have you found, how are you continuing to build stewardship, equity and engaging with communities, particularly at this time, because we're not, on one side yet and we're not on before either so like what what tools have been really important for you right now to keep building that stewardship and keep it alive and keep people like excited to to move on to keep to move forward i guess um, i can jump in so 
Um, I've been working on our comprehensive plans with our 10 year policy strategic plan. It's kind of wonky, but it's it's awesome and we're it's we love it. It's it's going well, but now, you know, how do we keep up the momentum of bringing in diverse voices and making sure that it continues to be a very, you know, community engaged process um, in these last couple months. And so one small success story that I have in all of this navigation, like daily kind of learning stuff and some speed bumps and some breakthroughs um, is that yesterday I had a call. So we have a large East African population in Minneapolis, primarily Somali. Um, and I, I am working with a gentleman that has uh, works with a media, kind of a, a cultural media outlet. He's got something like 10,000 followers on his Facebook stream. And so he's actually gonna partner with us now that we're offering this community meeting via Zoom as part of this summit we're offering next week, we are, which was gonna originally, originally just be a, a half day session inside of a room getting a lot of community there to talk to each other, right? Now we've transitioned it to go online, we'll be there for a week. And we're partnering with all sorts of organizations to get the word out and to convene conversations. And so this media outlet is gonna be amazing. We're, we're gonna be able to, to tap into this community of 8,000 people through this social media feed that we wouldn't have had access to if we had just been asking people to come into a room. Um, so. It's like a victory for, <laughs> for technological engagement that I'm holding on to right now because there, there's also, like I said, a lot of speed bumps and a lot of challenges and the di digital divide is real um, and there's generational divides. There's all sorts of divides, you know, within the digital engagement world, but um, that, was a, that was a good one yesterday. That's awesome. Yeah, and I think from from our end about stewardship, you know, I think there's a big push, I think, in my field because I'm in a field that is very underrepresented. And um, unless we figure out um, genuine ways to integrate those perspectives, we're going to end up with the same solutions that, you know, we have had many crises. We have rethunk cities. We have rethunk this and rethunk that. But unless you actually have a representation from of the policy, the people who are making policy and the people who are designing places, it's going to look exactly the same and it's going to not reflect the people who live in those neighborhoods. So like I, I push this a lot that um, people need a period of a little bit of self-reflection, but a, a little bit of um, self-definition. And I think right now needs to be a period of self-definition that invites the diverse communities in to the table that makes decisions. It cannot be someone else making decisions for these communities. And I think when I look at Phoenix, how, we're really diverse. We're really diverse. And who's making decisions? Not the people that are diverse. And I think this really, if there's a time that we need to do it, it we need to do it right now. Yeah, I uh, definitely echo those, those comments. Um, I am sort of three, three major thoughts around this and this concept of stewardship and engagement. Um, true stewardship, true engagement, it's not supposed to be easy. And I think we all need to ensure that we're going into that mindset. As, you know, Carrie and Wanda said, that this is not, um, you know, there, there's some time off, you know, this sort of surface level, like, engagement that can happen, almost as if we have policymakers who say, check the box, right? Like, oh, right, I went out to the community, et cetera. Um, or I had a Zoom call, right? But what folks are talking, like Wanda and Carrie are talking about, I love that it is taking a deep dive, ensuring that that leadership really gets to the, the second point is that it's not engagement, but it's actually community leadership that is driving the stewardship and engagement agenda. And you've seen that, that that can change policy, that that can change those systems, those invisible systems that are sort of inflicting uh, potential harm to, to our communities and that that voice has to be at the table. And so what are the, the third piece of that uh, to me is that then what are the processes or the, the, the tools that um, community leadership, how can we, we as professionals potentially in this space is, and, and their community expertise, what are the, how can we facilitate this and sort of be, be humble to, enough to take a step back, right? Um, and I think that's really, um, th that takes 
uh, time, and that takes uh, even with Zoom calls, uh, being leveraging art and creativity to be able to engage in that space, whether it's um, sort of taking like mural board ideas uh, and pulling them together, uh, whether that's taking this new digital space and uh, using that so that people can sort of ideate and um, plan together in a in a very collective action sort of forum. Totally, thank you. Um, I I appreciate the the difference between community leadership as opposed to only engagement. I think that's that's key to approach and to be involved and 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 for this call to action to to do it in a way that feels true to what we what people need and you know and and to take to take all together the action that we need to move towards that to, towards that resilience that one that was talking at the beginning towards that care for spaces that Carrie was talking about to this public health and community well-being that you mentioned as well. Um, so I guess my next my next question will be now that we had this this call for action uh, in, that, in that spirit so as we move to this recovery and resilience that this uh, situation has put us in to this new normal, uh, how we're calling it, what tools, what will be your, the tools that, and learnings that we can take with us and which will be the ones that you will absolutely leave behind or that we need to leave behind to get to a place of, of, of growth from the bottom, from like a rooted growth? Maybe I can just interject and I'll, I'll provide a project. Well, a couple of projects that we're doing in Phoenix, we have brought in local artists from this place, because I'm not from this place. I'm from far, far up north. And my reservation is very, very far from here. And I brought in local indigenous artists and we're doing projects, highly visible projects. One of them will be a six story building with an indigenous Salt River artist's artwork on the side of it like visible, in your face, no mistake about it, very localized, hyper-localized. Um, but I think th this notion of kind of shifting it out of the control of an architect or a developer or a policymaker to our local community, we need to somehow bring this to our upper leadership in the cities. Like it, ha We have to ch really change the status quo because we have a centuries of status quo that ha that we have to shake out. And I think, you know, kind of um, pushing back with really um, alarming uh, disruption is the way that needs, I think right in this particular time needs to be done. Thank you. Sadia, I know you had a thing you wanted to jump in before. Um, no, I think, uh, I think like Wanda is saying is, is completely accurate. We're not new to pandemic. We're not new to sort of the situation. Um, the the founding of this country uh, occurred in a context of smallpox being spread by blankets um, uh, to to native tribes uh, and original people. Um, we conducted trials on uh, uh, black community members um, specifically just to uh, understand what what syphilis was doing to the body. We have used um, these germs as, as a form of weapon. And I am deeply, and, and I think A, we need to recognize that history um, and that history is, um, it has continued ramifications for today. And that in order to sort of, sort of chisel a path forward or work on a path forward, that, that reframing has to occur. And that reframing has to occur in a way where there is cross-sectoral partnerships as we've referred to, there's community leadership. Um, and then that there is a lot of listening, but that um, we are not good at that as a, as a society quite openly, um, uh, quite candidly. And so there, that listening is, again, it's the, it's the time, um, but there's this great, um, article in the Financial Times of India by um, Arundhita Roy of looking this, uh, looking at this pandemic as a portal and looking at it as a portal of are we going to continue to carry the baggage that we have had for uh, you know centuries and are we going to carry this baggage through uh, this portal or are we going to leave some of that behind and and potentially uh, really um, 
sort of catalyze that change as we as we move forward and activate each other in in ways that you know we would never would have. I'm a public health professional um, and have never worked for a nature conservancy um, uh, or like you know nature focused community development organization, um, and it has been completely eye opening. And so, how do we then individually as professionals take risks while sort of magnifying um, the role of these intersections really play? I love that. Thank you, Sadia. Carrie, you want to go? Yeah, I've um, I've some very small but mighty things in terms of tools that I, I think that COVID has amplified the importance of that. Um, for example, the role of communications and clear communications um, in public spaces and how can we get creative graphically and in the way that we use signage. I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I love wayfinding and experimenting with all sorts of ways of communicating in space. And I think um, that's been a really interesting thing to watch in COVID. Uh, and I hope that we continue to you know, keep up the momentum with how we are sharing information with people um, in a welcoming way and um, in, a, in a way that's accessible to all sorts of ages and linguistic groups. Um, and I think that's just a critical piece that I feel like we've had to be very, very careful about in COVID. Um, and I hope that care continues. Um, I'll, I think same thing with placemaking and, and just creative problem solving in general. I feel like those are really, it's, I feel like people have been just at their best and working so hard to try to figure out, you know, in these larger institutions that are managing public spaces, how to, how to, how to do it right. Um, and failing some too, and uh, having to having to change your plan every day. And I mean, having government change their plan every day is uh, it's not the norm. Not yeah, it's it's been really interesting to see that government um, also can be nimble, right? Mm -hmm. um, so those are all things I'm taking away in this from this COVID thing. And I I think that also and I don't mean to say thing in a I'm, I'm sort of downplaying it. Um, I also think too that collectively as a nation and as a globe, I mean, this is a, this is a really wild time to, to watch how one person's actions can impact a group, right? And there's something very um, kind of anti-American and, and anti-capitalist and anti-individualistic about um, some of what I see that's happening during COVID that um, on, the, on a deeper level that I, I want to hold on to. And um, I, I hope that we all do and um, continue to set up systems that really work. Like as Wanda mentioned early on, the idea of indigenous learning from you know our, our indigenous ways, whether you come from Scottish Germanic heritage or uh, or, or from this land, um, and how important that is to to hold on to in a very deep way as a learning from COVID. Thank you. Um, it is uh, 1.50. Um, I'm going to hand it to Johanna. It's been super inspiring to hear all of you. Um, I think there is a lot of information here to take with everyone and, and, and run with it for, for a positive and encouraging look out into the future. Um, I think it's a good time for Q&A, but I'm going to hand it to Johanna because I know uh, she was going to do a closing anyway. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we, we just got a question in from the audience, which I will share with everyone on the panel. Um, Amanda asks, art walks such as the first Friday that happens monthly in Phoenix have always been a major creative outlet for, um, for many of us here um, since they were free and open to anyone and successfully are able to draw quite a diverse crowd. What do you think these events will look like moving forward? Or how can we learn from this moment in moving them forward, perhaps, too? Well, you know, in relation to kind of this notion about density and rethinking uh, density and de um, creating more multinodal centers, you know, do they become smaller? Do they become um, less populated? Do they become more divert, more 
um, diffused within the city? And do we as architects and planners start to build places? Do we need to build places that could accommodate these six foot or whatever the, the new ratio will be? You know, do we need to actually redesign and rethink about where and how those activities take place? I, I could respond briefly. Um, two things come to mind when we talk about an art walk. Um, it's sort of this trend that's also occurring um, sometimes near parks, um, which is of open streets, right? So as we think about closing um, traditional paths to, um, you know, cars, right, and, and opening them up to walkers and bikers, um, and knowing that from the public health world that has implications for health outcomes, that, that people have um, spaces to be active, to sort of find um, a mental health, right? So that, that's sort of one thing. Um, and then two is sort of really from the perspective of sort of um, creativity and cross-collaboration, right? So I absolutely love the uh, Tiger King uh, social distancing, a tiger is six feet long uh, image, right? And so what what happens when we take that kind of um, that popular language, that popular culture of references and art, and really look at how these cross sector um, what cross sector opportunities may exist? Right? Is there someone within the local health department who can uh, come together to advise on what's the best way to do this? Because people will need art for healing. This is a very traumatic time for. Our um, the globe, and there is going to be um, a, a, a role for faith and art to come together in that recovery and resilience. And I would also caution, you know, we just read, I just read an article this morning on airflow and how it um, unfortunately increases the droplets, the, the spread of droplets. You know, when you sneeze, it's like three feet or whatever, but when you have some airflow behind it, it's like 20 feet. Mm. So, you know, I think this has to, it's a whole infrastructure. You know, I'm starting to think about air that goes from the ground up and shoots up instead of sideways. You know, we're, there's all these things that we're, I don't know, does it change our public space? Can we actually change the airflow to make ourselves safe? I, I don't know, possibly. <laughs> And that's true for buildings, right? And this is, I know, a public space conversation, but um, Joseph Allen of the, the um, Built Environment Center at Harvard uh, was specifically was talking about what are the implications for how we think about design, structural design, um, uh, and, and the, the way that some of our buildings are not going to be well ventilated, right? Um, where we see, uh, for example, I'm from Baltimore, Maryland, and we see um, the differences block by block of what historic redlining has meant um, for infrastructure, and that infrastructure has implications for who gets, who, you know, has asthma, essentially. And so um, that component around airflow is going to be very, very important, and that environment is really, really important. Yeah, and just to throw an example in there, you know what the LA in Los Angeles, there's a mall that they took the walls down and made it an outdoor mall. And all of a sudden, if you put the airflow in the bottom, that you have a safe art gallery, right? It's outdoors, the airflow is going up. You know, I, I, there's solutions out there, but we just have to really kind of all come together and, you know, help with architecture, with planning, with development. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, thank you, Wanda. I think that that's definitely a theme that's come up in terms of it needing to be this grassroots, everyone having a voice, and <clears throat> also being back to, to local knowledge and power towards building a, a cross-sectoral collaboration kind of space. Um, so I know that we have a, quite a range of different people with different backgrounds and expertise on the call. Do you all have one quick takeaway or action item that we can leave this with in terms of taking our own individual um, expertise or ideas or connections forward so that we are ready to collaborate and connect across sectors or boundaries as we're building towards our our future, whatever that might look like, the other end of the portal. Um, I can jump in. I think, I mean, for any students on the phone that are in art and design, I, I think that um, you know, I, I consider myself first and foremost probably a creative practitioner and 
uh, that's a huge force for me in, in systems change work. And I see it uh, you know, personally for me, but I think that the, the, the strength and the power that you'll bring to any kind of system or complex system and the thinking you know, that you can bring as someone that is a creative, has creative process and, is, and knows your own creative process, I just uh, can't underline that enough as something that it's such a gift to, to the world and super excited to have you out here with us. If you are still students, I wish I could talk to you all and see your faces, but nice to meet you. Thank you. Thank you, Carrie. Creativity is a huge tool for success for this moment. Sadia, I saw your... Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and I think uh, as, as students or young professionals in this space, um, uh, identify, to, for me personally, it's often about identifying um, creative opportunities to learn from a different lens. And that means taking the risk um, when and if possible, which is not always possible, to sort of um, it, identify a new, uh, new way to, to look at things, right? So find an organization that you never thought what you would have worked for potentially. Um, find a, a collective that, uh, you know, an art collective that, that traditionally may not have um, uh, been where you, you may have engaged. And, and see if there are opportunities to, to learn, uh, walking in humbly, of course, um, but, uh, to, you know, taking that risk when feasible um, and if it, you never know what kind of other creativity may stem from that. Great. Wanda, you have a pointer. You, you're muted. Apologies. I thought it was for the audience that you were asking for comments. So I, <laughs> I didn't really prepare anything. No, I'm good with what our lady said. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you all for sharing. I feel like um, I think the, the main you've given us lots to think about in terms of how we really need to be vigilant and create space for lots of people to come together towards shaping a collective future that can mobilize local power. And um, so thank you all so much for sharing today to Sadia, Carrie, Wanda and Sophia. Um, this uh, this is, we have one more panel in this conversation coming up next Thursday called Rest as Resistance, where we're talking to um, a group of artists um, who are both have studio practices as well as um, more from a arts activist stance. There's more information at the chat, it's happening next Thursday. Um, but in the meantime, thank you for joining us this afternoon and I hope that you all um, have a good weekend, which is somehow a holiday weekend. So thanks for joining today. Thank you so much. All right. Thank you.